A long 220 days is now over. Quakes fans somewhat rejoicing, but they're not out of the woods just yet. We'll analyze, break it down, take some of your Twitter questions. This is Black and Azul, episode number eight, coming to you, and it's next. Cheers for tuning in to another episode of Black and Azul alongside Alex Morgan back for popular demand and Joel Soria. <laughs> I am Charles Wolin. The Quakes win for the first time in a long time. It seemed like forever, but 220 days was the actual number from what they had. We'll start it off with Tommy Thompson right in the beginning before the match started. He gave kind of an impassioned speech to Comcast California, and here's what he had to say. We have to be together. We have to be precise. I don't care what happened last game. I don't care what happened the game before that. Today we're going to be different. And if it's not this week, it's going to be next week. I believe in this team. I believe in this coach. I believe in this organization. We're going to fix this. So Tommy Thompson saying this right to the camera, to Danielle Slayton. Mm -hmm. A very impassioned speech. I've never really heard too many players have this kind of impassioned, intense speech right to a camera that's covering their actual team. And then, of course, they got they went on and they won 3-0. What do you make of this? Yeah, I think Tommy really hit the nail on the head. I, I guess I have to backtrack from what I said last week. Last week I said that you could more or less write off the Quakes this season. You know, I think that Almeida's focus right now is mostly on the performance and not necessarily result. But that was a very strong performance from the Quakes, and I think that it shows that they have something to play for this season. Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys again. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, no, as, as Alex was saying, it was uh, an impactful for performance from the Earthquakes from the get-go, right? It's starting off and even in the stat sheets, just completely running all over Portland. Get granted, Portland is not doing really well mm -hmm. right now. They're in shambles themselves, having won in four games after that one. But the Earthquakes were, were dominating in every aspect. Another thing that I really noticed and I liked about this Quake uh, this Quakes team on Saturday was that they were able to defend as well. And we mm -hmm. haven't really seen that from the Quakes this season. Not only were they generating uh, attacking opportunities, but they were also holding holding their, their marks, right? And Matias Almeida has talked about you know, not wanting to stick with a solid back line. And they obviously have moved away from that. And there's been a lot of different adjustments as well. We'll talk about the new players that were put into the system and, and you know, the results that they gave out after 90 minutes. But yeah, all in all, it was a really good, you know, compelling performance from the Earthquakes for the first time this season. And, and look, I think it's hard to take away you, you can't take away too much from the game. You know, you play LAFC one weekend, they're probably the best team in a in MLS, you lose 5-0 to them. Then you play probably the worst team in MLS, the Portland Timbers, you win 3-0. So, you know, the Quakes aren't as good as the best team, they're not as bad as the worst team. They're somewhere in the middle. Um, but it's hard to say where exactly right now. Yes, yeah, we, we always say on this show that we're always going to get more information as we go further forward mm -hmm. under Matias Almeida, what his best team is. I don't think he knows his best team. There's been so many changes. Let's talk about those changes. I think he might want to stay with this team. I mean, I, clearly, I, I yeah. don't think you changed the team at this point, but Danny Hooson in the team, Florian Youngworth, and Jackson Yule all come into the side uh, this last week. Let's start with Danny Hooson. He got in behind three times in the first 15 minutes. At he least. also scored yeah. uh, as well. Plenty of service uh, for him, and, and he, he, he really um, you know earned a spot. Yeah, without a doubt, Danny Husen has been one of Jesse Fiorinelli's best signings. Mm. Here's a player that really just boasts this technical abilities that, you know, could really, really just show that this player had a, a future, obviously, in Europe. He could still be playing at a pretty elite level in Europe, right? And he wouldn't, he wouldn't struggle. And that is translating over, and that has translated over to MLS ever since he arrived in 2017. Last year, he was the, the leading goal scorer for the team. This year, you know, obviously, given the fact that he was dealing with all of those green card issues and permanent residency issues, 
he was plagued by that and wasn't able to really train with the team or obviously feature when the team played those previous three games. But he showed his abilities uh, against Portland. You know, he easily could have had a hat trick. He changed the game. It's night and day with Danny Husen on the field. And we've been talking about this and we've been trying to pitch him. And I think everyone who follows Earthquakes has been trying to pitch Danny Husen also alongside him, Florian Youngworth, who had an exceptional game as well. And he's changed the entire dynamic of the team. Yeah, and I think, you know, Almeida gave Danny his opportunity to start, and, and Hoosian took it. Uh, he, he looked really good. He had dangerous runs in behind. Uh, Jackson Ewell hit him with a couple uh, really good passes. Uh, and I think that his hold up play was also good in, in the build up to, I think it was the Quake's second goal. Uh, his own goal, he had a beautiful flick into Erickson, and then he followed up the shot for a rebound. Uh, I, I would say, though, that I think his, his touch was a tad long. You could still see him working off some of the rust. His finishing was also off. You know, you say he could have had a hat trick. I think he should have had a hat trick. He had a couple one on one chances. And Matthias that talked he about that today. Yeah, exactly. In the press conference, he did mention that he does want to see Danny finish a lot better than he has. And that, you know, we were talking about this in the press box as well on, on game day. Danny Husen could have easily scored 20 goals last season, mm -hmm. and he's could have been he he has could have been a double digit goal scorer ever since he arrived from Groningen. He's a really really uh, potent striker, right? He just needs to be that finisher inside the box, that clinical killer finisher. Unfortunately, it hasn't been that that Danny Husen, but maybe in the future it could be. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a, a completely dynamic striker. He gets in behind, but also he gets in the wide areas, too. You see him chase down balls, hold yeah. up balls in the wide areas, and allow the wide players to get into his position. Um, and, and, and there's much to be said about that. He's not, you know, your your root one, brute four striker that you're going to, you know, play balls into, and he's not going to have a lot of movement. He, he is a, a dynamic different player that that is able to adapt to get into those wide areas too um, and, and cause a lot of havoc. Let's talk a little bit about Florian Young work in the back line. The back line has had its issues this year and also we haven't really talked a lot about this on the show but center back pairings. Center back pairings are always very important and mm -hmm. this is the first time that we've seen a shake up at the center back pairing. And so this is the first time that uh, Florian Youngworth has had his chance. He also can play in defensive midfield. We've seen him do that for the it's Quakes before. It's his preferred position. But he slots in there, and he does quite nicely. Good on the ball, good touch, um, nice work out of the back, and comfortable with the ball out of the back after Cummings wins balls right next to him. So what did you guys think of that partnership and, and, and flow? I think they... they more or less completely shut down Portland's main man and Diego Valeri. You know, Valeri has struggled, uh, you know, all, all of this season, um, but he really didn't have any any good opportunities. Uh, and I think they, they, they man-marked him tight, they didn't let him get the ball, and they, they looked good. Yeah, I, th I think there's a good balance between Cummings and, and Florian. You know, they, they're both compatible. They both complement each other. And Florian has been itching to play, guys. You know, I, I, I've been talking to him and I, I've spoken to, to people around the club. He's been wanting to play, but for a reason or another, he hasn't, he wasn't able to. And, you know, sometimes out of dark situations, you know, come, come good ones. And unfortunately, Garam Kasha is out for the next couple of weeks, at least four, two to four weeks now. And he did have a cast on him uh, after the game on Saturday. So it looks like Florian Youngworth is going to be that number one option. And it doesn't look like Cummings is going anywhere. Matias Almeida is keen on the Panamanian, as he is with Aníbal Godoy as well. These players are going to be playing with each other for the coming weeks, and I think it's going to serve the Earthquakes well because, like Kuzin being on the field, it was night and day with Florian you know, being that, that tandem partner with uh, Cummings. And I would say the one thing to, to watch out for is set pieces in the box. Uh, last season when Florian was playing at center back, the Quakes were very vulnerable on set pieces. And I think you saw a little bit of that against Portland. I think Portland's best chance was early in the second half from a Diego Valeri free kick. And, you know, Florian's mark rised above him, rose above him, and got a good header on target, which uh, took a good uh, Daniel Vega save to, to stop. And on the flip side, he's also dangerous on set pieces as well. We saw him get onto the end this of the few true. crosses to be able to create. Yeah, he almost had a goal. Yeah. He almost had a goal. So let's talk about Jackson Yule. Uh, you know, balance in central midfield. He hasn't changed up the central midfield uh, three very much. But this is the first time that Matias Almeida's kind of changed that up a little bit. And he's in there as the number eight kind of box to box role. Um, yeah. 
I liked it. I liked it. He, there's nothing revolutionary about Jackson Yule. I think we kind of we can all agree on it. But he he does have this poise that not a lot of midfielders his age have. You see him on the field, and he it, it seems like he has like five eyes. You know, he mm -hmm. he knows where to run. He knows where to place the passes, and he knows how much precision needs to be put on the ball. He had a couple of sublime passes to I believe Danny Husen and they have a really good connection Jackson Yule is one of those other players that after the game he had on Saturday there's no reason why you shouldn't play him you know he's part of the uh, the youth U.S. men's national team system potentially could be a U.S. men's national team player in the future you know give him the minutes you know in this case play the kids he's doing really well Jutson's still injured he might be coming back Probably won't be available. Not entirely sure about that, but Jackson's playing really well. Let him play. I would say that there's one concern that I have, which is uh, in terms of defense. You know, Judson is a stopgap in the middle. Jackson doesn't quite have the same defensive skill set. Uh, and both he and Godoy have a tendency to roam. And so there were a couple times, especially as their legs got tired at the end of the first half and in the second half, where, you know, they were caught out and there were large spaces in the middle. Uh, for Portland to exploit. And when playing against a better team, that could be dangerous. I think Matias Almeida is going to have a selection headache when Judson is fit again because mm -hmm. Judson is a, is a very, very special defensive midfield player. Um, and, uh, you know, but made, Matias was convinced yeah. with the way that Godoy played that six spot, right? He mm -hmm. said it after the game. He was very pleased with the, the way the Panamanian played. And I, like I said, we can probably see that, that two you know, those two midfielders continue on for the games coming up. Better to have a selection headache than not, though, moving forward. Yeah, Seriously. Fair. Let's talk about Shea Salinas uh, popping up on the left wing, yep. coming in on his right foot that we... His natural position. ...customarily yeah. usually see mm -hmm. him do, and making runs in from the left side and scoring the first goal of this game with the captain's armband. Really impressive work by Shea Salinas. Yeah, very well deserved for him. You know, he's he's been behind the scenes working day in and day out. He's been doing it for years and years now for the black and blue, and if it's not Chris Wondolowski, it's obviously Shea Salinas. So it came at a good time. He He's found himself playing that, that position that's made Shea Salinas the player that he is now. He's not being forced to play out of position. It's good for him, and it's good for the team. Yeah, after all these years, uh, you know, with so many changes, Shea Salinas is still your man. Uh, he's not revolutionary. He's very predictable. He will fake towards the middle and go down the line. But it's very efficient and very consistent. And it's still working, even after all these years. Exactly. <laughs> and I think the, the one thing that, uh, you know, stood out as a little odd to me uh, is the fact that, you know, when Shea returned to the left wing, Wando got you know, got benched because they have a great connection. And I think that part of the reason that Wando's been struggling is that he's lacked that service. And you saw both Shea and Espinoza put in really good service uh, with cutbacks into the box. And that's yeah. part of the reason why the Quakes did so well. Yeah, and that's that's one thing that Espinosa told us after the game on Saturday as well, that he laments that, you know, him and, and Shea in this instance weren't able to put that service in for Wando, right? The same service that they were able to put in for Husen. Because, you know, that that dynamic on, on either flank changed the game completely for the Earthquakes, right? The numbers show it, the stats line show it as well. This team was completely different in the attacking scheme. Unpredictable, uh, cohesive, and overall, the most importantly, dangerous. Look, in the first four matches, you know, Vaco didn't do it for me. Uh, he, 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 he hasn't done it all games. season, and we said it, he, we said he, it here last week. He didn't make week. an impact, and Shea came in, and Shea made an impact. Yeah, and that's what you need. Right from the off, and, and Marcos Lopez now back in the the lineup as well, left back. Um, you, you could see that, you know, he's still working off the rust from, mm -hmm. you know, some of his injury. He's still uh, adapting. He's still a young, he's a young player. What I really enjoy and about him is every time he gets the ball, he's always moving forward every single time. Of course, he can play the ball out of the back. Of course, he's comfortable with the ball at his feet like the coach and the manager asks him to do. But what I most like about him is he he always takes on his defender. Mm -hmm. he, and it, it, It's really fun to watch, watch him progress. He, he um, loves to step into the middle. And Absolutely. So far, that has worked very well. 
Uh, it could be cause for trouble down the line because Portland started to read it. His man started to read but he the was elect- fake down the line he was and step a- in the middle. So that could could become a point of concern down the line. But so far, it's worked very well. And I think that he also uh, d- d- did well because with Shea in front of him, Shea is very aggressive down the wing, so Lopez didn't have to overlap as much so he could step into the middle uh, and wasn't caught out. It's not time to panic with Lopez. And I think after four games, a lot of people were saying, oh, this guy's probably not it. You know, we have this left back curse. Lopez mm-hmm. is going to do really well in this league, I think. He needs time to adapt. It's a, it's a, it's a new culture for him. It's a new team. It's, it's a different playing style, the one that he's trying to, you know, play under Matias Almeida. He's eventually going to get it down. There is a lot of potential in him. And he's played that left mid position before at Sporting Cristal. That's where he played it. And that's probably we, why he has that, that itch to move into the center of the field. But there's no, there's no doubt about it. Marcos Lopez, to me, should be starting week in and week out. Let's talk about goalkeeping for a second. He's been con- the, probably the most consistent player out of the starting 11. But clean sheet. Daniel Vega. Well, I would say, except for one moment against LAFC. But he <laughs> did make up for that uh, yeah. with a key penalty Rightfully save so. against, against Portland. Yeah, Daniel Vega, there was, I questioned it a little bit. You know, you're bringing in a 34-year-old from USL, former NASL uh, Golden Glove winner. But, you know, he hadn't played in MLS before. 34 is still relatively young, I guess, for a goalkeeper. Not really. Towards the twilight, but you still have that, that space there. And I, I was I was really intrigued on how he was going to perform for this team. I knew he was going to be brought in to be the goal, uh, starting goalkeeper. But, you know, like I said before, this is a player that really just changes the locker room atmosphere. And on the pitch, he's done wonders as well. I don't think any of us expected, you know, the, the, the goalkeeping performances that he's been putting up week in and week out. Obviously, the stats lines don't really back him up too well on that aspect, but... The game against Portland, it finally paid, you know, paid dividends for him and good for him. Well, look, I've been very impressed with him both on and off the field. On the field, he's very confident. Um, you know, he, he's I a think leader. he's good he's in the leader. He's good in the air, which is something that uh, the Quakes have struggled with in the past. That just he's good with his feet for the most part, which you know gives him a sense of assurance at the back and, and off the field. Yeah, he's a leader. He has a, a very strong mentality, uh, and, and you can see him becoming a big presence and, and big figure in the locker room. Let's talk about Nick Lima here for a minute. Matias Almeida, after the match, had to say this. Pero sí queremos mucho Nick. Sabemos que la gente lo quiere mucho, nosotros también, y lo pondremos en unas condiciones para que que sea Nick ese de selección. This is a guy that started for the national team in January. Out of the side now. Where do you see this going, Joel? Well, that's a that's a really tough question. You know that that's that's something that I'm sure Matias Almeida is struggling to figure out. Here you have a player who's proven uh, in the league, and now also made a statement for himself in in the international realm. But where do you fit Nick Nick Lima in this system? I think for now, Almeida is sold that TT is a starting right back, and at left he has Marcos Lopez. I would argue that it, the, the Quakes would be better off with having Nick Lima as a right back. He's the natural right back. He's a major asset to the team, and he needs simply playing time. He just needs playing time. He showed it when he got onto the field. He has his chip on his shoulder, and he wants to keep improving. He wants to keep making that same upwards trajectory that he's been on. It's, it's, a, it's a disservice, truthfully, to, to sit him out. Look, it's a zero-sum competition between Tommy Thompson and Nick Lima for playing time. Uh, And I think that, you know, from his goal celebration, you know, you can see that he might be a little drained. There's, you know, I I think that shows a couple things. One, it shows that he's a consummate professional. He's doing his job. He's doing everything he can. Um, But from the looks of it, I think he he looked a little tired as well. A a, a little, um, you know, like you said, he has a chip on his shoulder. I think the manager is is fairly kind of set in his ways of how he, you know, visualizes this team and and who's going to be in the starting eleven. So Tommy's going to stay, and it's for Nick to upset him or Marco Lopez. And Marco Lopez is also Matias Almeida's signing, uh, so it's equally as hard. 
but, but to give to, be, to, to, to give credit to give credit though to Nick is that the the, the the depth is very thin right now. It shouldn't the depth be this, is very thin. So he will get another chance. Yes. It's just when. But right now, unfortunately, he's not in the team right now. I think he should be in the team, but he's not in the team. Yeah, and that's the problem is that Nick shouldn't be waiting for chances within the San Jose Earthquakes. Maybe waiting waiting for chances at a club, you know, at a German club like Hertha Berlin, that's understandable. But waiting for opportunities at, at the San Jose Earthquakes, that shouldn't be happening with Nick Lima at all. He should be playing game in and game out. He was the only player to play every single minute last year, and he did phenomenal doing so. It earned him a shot with the U.S. men's national team. He went, he impressed Burhalter, and now... If this continues, there's a chance that he won't be at the Gold Cup, which is a huge loss, not only for him, but for the San Jose Earthquakes themselves. And there's a chance that, you know, he could be picked up by another MLS team. You know, I, I, there are plenty of MLS That's teams who are looking for, looking for strong anyone, fillbacks. Anyone, Portland is one of them. Anyone in the league would take Nick Lima in exactly. a Anyone. If, if, if he's not Almeida's man, he has plenty of options in MLS to go elsewhere, I'm sure. And we saw where Steven Betasher went. We saw where Justin Morrow went when the Quakes had that excellent team in, in 2012, and those were the two starting outside backs. Yeah, you, you would assume, though, that now as, as the years have progressed and maybe, you know, with a, with a new front office that the Earthquakes wouldn't make the same mistakes that they've made before, right? With letting Betasher go, uh, letting Morrow leave as well, and even maybe David Bingham, you can argue that as well. Because, uh, you know, on the field, David Bingham is a really talented goalkeeper, right? He's, he's, he was playing for the U.S. men's national team as well, representing the country. And maybe, yes, he had his differences off the field. He had his differences with the front mm -hmm. office. But, you know, you don't want this to happen with Nick Lima. And I'm not saying it's going to happen or anything like that at all. But what I'm trying to say here, what I, what I am trying to say is that Nick Lima needs to be treated a bit better in terms of, you know, playing time. The Quakes need to do everything they can to make sure it doesn't get to that point. Right. That's the point. Yeah, and maybe he'll play his way into the side. Maybe he won't. I think we're all in agreement here that he's a player that should be starting within this team. Another player that didn't see the field for the first time in 10 years after being in the 18 was club captain Chris Wondolowski. Here's what Matias Almeida had to say about that. No, in realidad lo difícil es cuando el equipo no consigue el resultado y tenemos que empezar a mover, digamos, posiciones y jugadores, pero ellos saben que son todos importantes, que yo voy a utilizar a todos en el transcurso de este año. Y seguramente Chris eh, este año va a cumplir ese sueño y ese reto que tiene de, de convertirse en el goleador histórico. Eh, por ahí sentía que él también estaba cargando con mucha presión y muchas veces eh, hacerlos descansar un poco y que, que, que se les vaya esa presión a ellos mismos porque acá somos todos, no uno solo. Eh, por ahí le viene mejor a Cris, pero sí, él se sigue entrenando de la misma manera, con una excelente actitud, y bueno, esto marca de lo, de lo gran profesional que es. It's rare to see the Quakes win, Wando not being even part of this team, Alex. I think it was a no-brainer substitution to bring Wondolowski in as the third sub. I was very surprised that, that Almeida put Vaco in instead of Wando. I think you know, you're up comfortably, you're in cruise control. It's a great opportunity to give Wando some confidence to get him on the field. Uh, and maybe, you know, the Quakes get a penalty to, to get closer to breaking that record. And I think it begs the question what Almeida's plans for Wondolowski are. Yeah, actually, Matias Almeida assessed, you know, sitting, benching Chris Wondolowski for the entire 90 minutes today. And what he had to say was that at times, he felt like Chris needed a break and he felt that he had too much pressure on him, which he has. He has had. I think it's fair to say that Wando has had immense pressure to break that record, not only from fans and not only from pundits and analysts, but from the club itself. I mean, you're you're, you're creating this whole marketing line of, you know, Wando watch and, and you hear him every week, week in and week out saying that he just wants to get it over with, you know, that it's it's just time to move on from his record, that he would like to finish it as soon as possible. 
And yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, Alex. What, what's gonna happen here? I, you can interpret this many ways. I, it could be simply that Matias, like he said, wants to give him a break, or it could be that Wando is now on the decline, right? Where the team is, I don't know, maybe getting ready for his departure at the end of the season, and they wanna slow him down and they've realized that victories are gonna come first, and they need to go and get victories, and they have. And, Sitting Wando on the bench, you know, isn't going to please him, but at the same time, it's not going to break him because at the end of the day, he is club, he has a club first mentality. And like we said this before, and everyone can agree as well, he bleeds black and blue. You know, this is his team forever. And and it's all it always is going to be that way. Yeah, and we talked about this on the first show. How, how do you manage this? How do you handle this? I think that the club is trying to do its best to be able to manage it, handle it in the, you know, um, most upright, beautiful, kind of swan songy manner that it can handle it. As a coach, obviously you're going to have a different opinion than the previous coach. Chris Wondolowski has had quite a few coaches at the Quakes. And for the Quakes, for all of these years, and this bobblehead even signifies it <laughs> right in front of this computer here, is this club is Chris Wondolowski's club, the San Jose Wondolowskis in, in a way, Wondo Watch, as you had said in a way. So it's, it's a, I think it's a strategic um, way of just going into the sunset at the end of a career and whether it's this year and he breaks it, great. If it's this year and he doesn't break it, you know, disappointing maybe for him and maybe for the fans, but you know, I think he's going to break it. He's going to break it. He's going to break, yeah. gonna break, gonna break, gonna break I, the record. I don't think that we should get too far ahead of themselves. You know, I, well, there's I still think 30 games. Wanda, anything Wanda can should, happen. Wanda, anything Wanda can will break happen. the record, and, and then I, and then I think you have to start having the discussions about what his role with the team team is in the future. But right now, I think Wando is still. You know, he's number. Uh, the Quakes only have you know two forwards in the in the match day 18. Him and Husen. So right. you know, he is going to be. A fixture for the Quakes this year. That's yeah, I, I don't. I don't think we're gonna see the Wando sitting out all game very often this season. There's 30 games left. There's gonna be a lot of trials and and, and uh, tribulations this year for the San Jose Earthquakes. I mean, it's it's a setback for him, obviously, to to break or that that 10 year record. But it's things are gonna look better for him. Some other good news for the San Jose Earthquake. Christian Espinoza in the MLS Team of the Week. Anibal Godoy on the bench. And Matias Almeida, El Profe himself, as the manager of the week, guys. I, I think he's earned it. Um, you know, he has been very, very, you know, dedicated to implementing his system. Um, and, you know, he's come under a lot of fire from us. Um, but Portland shows that, I think this game shows that the system has potential, uh, and if he sticks to his guns, uh, I, I think this team this team can do well down the line. Yeah, not surprising that they were on the team of the week. Cristian Espinosa, to me, was the best player of the week in the league. Fortunately, he didn't get that, uh, and Matias has earned it. You know, there's no reason why the league office would be against the San Jose Earthquakes doing well. They want to make San Jose that 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 give give them that exposure that they once had before right and and they want to you know write headlines of Matias Almeida doing well in San Jose it's it, it will benefit them greatly and we're seeing it now yeah and I would say that I think for me Espinosa uh, was definitely the standout performer for the Quakes and thoroughly deserves to be in that team of the week uh, he's been the standout performer for the Quakes so far this season you know you see uh, a goal and assist. One of the goals, his goal was just, you know, driving straight down the line and powering shot into the bottom corner. Uh, that sort of, you know, attacking impetus has been something that the Quakes have been lacking uh, so far this season. And, you know, uh, his assist, uh, you know, just a simple play, getting down the line, cutting the ball back. That's the kind of straightforward attacks that the Quakes need more of, and he's been providing it.
He's an absolute gem of a player. He's always consistent every match. And in, besides the goalkeeper, I think he is the second most consistent player uh, in this in this Quake side. Fun to watch. Also has kind of a little bit of a different upbringing, a little bit of a South American pedigree and European pedigree combination that he brings to this team, which is a hybrid that not too many of these players have. So uh, I really like Cristian Espinosa and, and what he's doing. And I'm a small guy. He's a little guy. you got to root for the little guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I just love it. I was able to talk with them uh have a one-on-one -on -one with him i'll have a feature on that shortly on quakes epicenter but yeah you know is a, a a great find for jesse and matias they sat him down in argentina they talked to him you know luring him from Villarreal, right Villarreal, but yeah. most recently boca juniors who he was there at, on a loan you know this is a player that had opportunities to go elsewhere there's no reason for him to come to San Jose. But obviously, Matias Almeida had a lot to do with that, and so did Jesse. Now he's here. He has the caliber, and he has the potential to really flourish in this league. And after four games, he's doing it. Quake's next opponent is Houston Dynamo. Here's what Florian Youngworth had to say in the press conference this week. Um, well, I think that helps a lot of talking. Um, that that you, I mean, it sounds simple, but um, in in the end, it's that that you have to believe in yourself and your strengths, and I, I think it was something last year we, we didn't have that because just won four games, and after a while we didn't believe in ourselves anymore, and I think this is something what Matthias said from from day one that everybody has to start to believe in himself, in himself, and in the group, obviously too. Um, then we additionally we have uh, with Jerry Lynch, uh, an, how you say, psychologist, 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 and that helps too. And these are all like little stones, which makes in the end uh, a strong team on the weekend and hopefully on Saturday again. You hear Flo talking about the intensity of practice uh, in their belief in themselves. They'll certainly need that fortitude going into another tough stretch of road games. Uh, they're playing the Houston Dynamo, then they're going to Sporting Kansas City, and then Seattle Sounders at home. A tough stretch. Joel, what do you think? They have a chance of getting the points in Houston? Yeah, I think the Houston Dynamo game is going to be the one where the Quakes have the, the better chance of, of taking points from these next three games. Uh, Sporting Kansas City is going to be difficult, and don't even mention the Sounders. That's, that's going to be a really, really tough challenge. But what I really found intriguing about Florian's words uh, the, today were, were that regarding of Jerry Lynch, the team psychologist. When was the last time we heard that the Quakes had a psychologist? I, I think it was a long time coming. This team needed a psychologist last year. I'm glad they have one this year because, look, Almeida it d does wonders in, in the psychological cognitive department, but they're also going to need someone like a professional psychologist to really get this these players out of that, out of that groove that they were in. Well, and you can you can sort of see a little bit of that creeping in again this year uh, against Portland. You know, they allowed the penalty early in the second half, and you know Almeida said it, Florian said it. They sort of got in their heads and they're thinking, shoot, are we going to allow three goals this time? Uh, you know, thankfully Vega saved the penalty, uh, but it's it's good to see that they're working on that mentality. Florian Youngworth is like a little espresso shot that you have, you know, <laughs> at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock. It's like a totally new signing for the San Jose Earthquakes. We didn't really see much of him in preseason. He's worked his way into this side uh, due to the injury of Gurum Kashia. For other and reasons that we shouldn't talk about, by the way, but yeah, I'll leave that in doubt. Yeah, and at the same time, here's a guy that's going to continue to provide his espresso shot every chance he can get saying that the mentality has changed under, under Matias Almeida and also saying they have a psychologist. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be able to share something like that. Uh, you know, mental health has a stigma in our world and uh, it's nice to see a professional athlete get the, get up on there and say, you know, even if we were 0-4, we lost 5-0 to LAFC, we have a therapist, we're trying to get on track here. Well, all the established teams in, in the world have therapists they they have psychologists who are there to back them the one team that i think of is the mexican national team you know they've been trying to get to that that quinto partido that fifth game that quarterfinal game in the world cup and this year the, or the previous world cup they brought in uh, a, a renowned you know psychologist to try and help that to try and get the players to just make that that extra leap right 
Because a lot of the times, you know, players go into these games and, and they have, you know, thoughts of what's happened before and, and all those, you know, all those words that pundits or, or the articles put out there of, you know, is it time? Are they going to do it now? Maybe not. Maybe they're going to relive the past. And stuff like that gets obviously really, really uh, embedded into these players' minds. So it's good. Yeah, it's good that Florian Youngworth spoke about that. And it's good that he was open to talk about the ways that the earthquakes are trying to relieve this 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 problem that you know that is convincing the players that they're good enough to play and that they're good enough to get over you know those dark times let's take a twitter question this one comes in from quan tran quan writes does the origin of the quakes next dp indicate who has more power and influence within the direction of the club i.e. Europe, Fiorinelli, or Mexico, Latin America, Almeida. I'm going to go back to November. It was at Avaya Stadium when Matias Almeida was first introduced to media members. Mm -hmm. And I, I recall that moment uh, clearly. Jeff Carlisle asked that first question, and he asked Matias Almeida and Jesse himself, who's going to be making the signings who's going to be calling the shots who has the authority is it going to be jesse or is it going to be el pelado and jesse was the one who answered it and he said that it was going to be a mutual agreement i after looking at the the previous signings or the latest signings of of the off season i think it's fair to say that matias is the one who has control of who comes in and who comes out of the team for the previous two years, it was all Jesse. Jesse was the one who was who was you know writing off the checks. He was the one who was bringing in the players. He was the one who was signing players off as well, like Fatia Lache and Quincy Ameriqua. He's pulling all the strings. He was pulling all the strings. There there was no one in between. And from what I've heard, you know, it, it even got to the point where Mikel Stare and and other coaches really had no say in who they wanted to bring in and who they didn't. The, the one exception from what I've heard was Kasia. Kasia was was a Mikel Stare signing or was influenced by Mikel Stare and Erickson wasn't, who, which many, many people believe that Erickson was, even I thought it initially that was a Stare signing, but, but he wasn't. So yeah, I think from what we can tell from this winter, Almeida has sig a significant, significant influence over the departures and the arrivals. And I'm excited. Almeida has, you know, a, a very strong pull. You know, he, he is able to attract a lot of top tier talent from Latin America. So I think that will make uh, it, it more interesting to see, you know, if the Quakes go into the market this summer to sign a DP. Well, that's how it should be though, right? At, at any high level, you know, institution, it should be the coach making the decisions. It should be the coach having significant influence over what players should be brought in and what players should be, you know, shut off. And and that wasn't happening in San Jose over the last two years. And now it is, and it's Matias Almeida. It's not any generic coach. It's Matias Almeida, it's 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 El Pelado, it's it's the CONCACAF coach of the year who is, you know, calling the shots. And obviously some of those signings are already paying dividends like Cristian Espinosa I think we can all agree has had an exceptional start to his 2019 campaign you know let's see what comes in the summertime the summer summer signings are going to be crucial for this team you wrote you you wrote the San Jose Earthquakes off I think they are going to compete for, at least for that seventh seventh seed if they want to compete the summer signings are going to have to be spot on Quan you have totally kind of poked the uh, the dragon here on, on that question. A very good question. Appreciate your question. Our next uh, Twitter question slash comment actually goes out here to Michael Rocha. He writes, how about a shout out for another Northern California team that also beat Portland, Oregon this past weekend? Of course, Michael is referring to Academica Soccer Club. 
his club that he is the GM of that beat Portland IPS, an amateur team up in Portland in the last round of preliminary qualifying for the US Open Cup uh, in its 107th edition, I believe. And now Academica will be hosting El Farlito. If you guys don't know, Academica actually um, raised the trophy back in the mid-1970s, as well as Farlito, uh, they also raised the U.S. Open Cup in the 90s. Should make for a remarkable matchup. Akidemika came from three goals down, scored three in stoppage time. Then they went to penalties, and they still won. Both teams went down to nine men. Uh, a couple of red cards on Portland's side. Akidemika, they had a red card, but also uh, a, one of their players got injured. They used all the subs. An amazing Amazing story. Follow them if you can, Academica Soccer Club on Twitter. And make sure you're there May 7th at Academica Soccer Field in Turlock. The rest of Northern California will be watching you. For Alex Morgan, Joel Soria, I'm Charles Wolin. Make sure you tell a friend about Black and Azul. Subscribe, like, comment. Any comment is a good comment. We'd love to hear your feedback. Keep that coming. And we'll see you next week for Black and Azul. Take care.